Well, as I've already mentioned this morning, we're going to be looking at um, the importance of the Word of God because this is what the Lord uses to save, right? This is what he used in Luther's life to save. He used the truth. And uh, again, um, th there were certain things that, that clouded that truth that uh, during his day that did not allow him to see it. We're going to see some of those particulars this evening. I am going to make reference to it this morning just to kind of line us up with what's happening this evening. But uh, those particulars we'll leave for this evening. What I want us to see this, this morning, of course, is how the Lord uses the gospel, how he uses his truth and only his truth to save and to sanctify. And of course, what the, the price is that we have to be willing to pay if we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, because that also is included uh, in, our, in our text. But let me go ahead and read the passage we'll be looking at this morning. Um, it's John chapter 17 in verses 14 through 19. Uh, this is a portion of the uh, prayer, what we call Jesus' high priestly prayer, as he is praying not only for those who are following him at that particular time, but also for everyone in the future who would believe in him because of their words. Remember, Jesus was about to be crucified. He was going to uh, you know, be raised again from the dead, be there for 40 more days, then ascend into heaven. There had to be those that would carry on that work. That would be the apostles. And so as they carried on that work, the Lord would bring people into his kingdom. He would save them. And uh, that is how we came into that kingdom, through the communication of this message throughout the years. So this is what Jesus prays uh, in this prayer, specifically regarding his word, regarding the truth, beginning in verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Now again, notice the number of times truth is mentioned in here. Notice Jesus gave them the word and the results of that, giving them the word. But, I, but notice what he says here, and this is the key to what we're looking at uh, this morning. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Well, what is truth? It's a question that Pilate asked, what is truth? Your word is truth. That is what we need to use because this alone is God's truth truth, okay? And we'll find that throughout Scripture. There were never references to anything but the Word of God. That is the authority. That is the standard. Well, may the Lord bless His Word to our understanding. Now, again, last week we were looking at uh, Luther's concern for his soul. Remember, Luther knew from reading God's law that he was in trouble. Uh, he understood in very general terms that, that he had never Love the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his mind and his soul and his strength. As Sproul said, even for one hour, not to mention what is actually required in Scripture, every single moment of our lives. And really, the second commandment, which, he, which Jesus says is like the first, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Luther had never done that, and neither had, of course, we. The lightning bolt that struck only a few feet from where he stood, knocking him to the ground only served to heighten his fear by reminding him of how temporary and fragile his life really was and how judgment might take place sooner than he expected. Luther, as again we were reminded, Luther really believed what the Bible said. He knew that God is righteous but that he was not righteous. He knew that God is just, that God must punish sin. And he knew that there was nothing that he could do to satisfy God's justice, that he would never be able to enter into heaven, but would inevitably descend into hell. 
And really the same thing was true of every single one of us when we came into the world. The difference is Luther understood it. He was awakened, awakened by the lightning bolt, awakened by the law of God to his need, and Luther was terrified. Now the problem was the church of his day was not able to alleviate his concerns. Remember the motto of the Reformation engraved in the Reformation wall in Geneva, after darkness, light. The church had gradually lost the gospel through the dark ages, through the middle ages. They had fallen into a view which is called sacerdotalism. And that is essentially the belief that God's grace, and it's the grace that Jesus has earned, and we'll learn this evening that there's, there's others earning this grace as well, but that this grace is actually given through the sacraments, consecrated by a priest who is in succession to Peter. In other words, grace is dispensed through the church. The priests become the mediators of salvation. They are the ones who offer the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to all who need it, but you have to come through the priests and you need the sacraments in order to be saved, in order to receive this grace. But they were wrong. They were in darkness. And Luther was one of the casualties of this particular view because Luther could not find peace of conscience, he could not find forgiveness, he could not find acceptance with God through the sacraments. Now tonight we're going to look at what the Lord did to bring light into Luther's life. And I'll just give you just a real brief sketch of the first lecture. But God in his mercy is going to move Luther from Erfurt, which is where the Augustinian monastery is, where, of course, he was you know, learning the system and seeking salvation. He's going to move him from that environment to the university. Frederick the Wise, the elector of Saxony, was seeking to establish in Wittenberg, where Luther would begin his work as professor of biblical studies. He had his master's working on his doctorate, but he was going to be able to complete that there. But he was going to be immersed in the study and the teaching of the scriptures. And here, God was going to reveal to him how he could be just, and yet the justifier of the one who has faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Luther didn't discover the gospel or the truth through the church. He discovered it through the word of God. So this morning, what I want us to consider is how important God's truth really is, not only for our salvation, although that is the most important thing, but for our sanctification, that we might become what it is the Lord wanted us to become when he saved us. Now, first of all, we need God's truth to be saved. And again, I would just point out, Luther was, he had his masters. He understood the teaching of the church. He was fully schooled in the learning of his day. He understood what the church taught regarding salvation. He had read the Vulgate. Remember, the Vulgate is the Latin translation of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek scriptures. Luther had read the Apostolic Fathers. Those are the ones that lived immediately after the apostles and wrote. He had read the Church Fathers. They're the next group that comes up after that. And what they had to say about how the Lord provides salvation. Luther had studied and he knew what the popes had to say. He knew what the councils had said. But all of this was not able to give him peace of conscience. And the reason, sadly, was because much of it wasn't true. We need truth. We need God to show us how we can be reconciled to him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the question is, where are we going to find that truth. Well, as I mentioned before, and Psalm 19 actually bore this out, there's really two places where the Lord reveals His truth. He reveals truth through the creation and, most importantly, through His Word. Now, with regard to the creation, remember, Paul writes this in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, from that time forward, His invisible attributes... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now, what Paul is saying here is that uh, 
the creation, general revelation, this knowledge of God that reaches to everyone throughout the world leaves everyone without excuse. It leaves them without excuse for several things. They know, and we know from what we see, that God exists. If somebody very powerful, very intelligent, very wise made this world and this universe. We know and they know from conscience, which the Lord has given to us, that we've sinned, we have disobeyed this one who has made all things, that we are guilty. No one can actually claim ignorance when it comes to what God actually wants us to do. Particularly if we've read the law of God, but even if we haven't, conscience tells us that we have sinned against God. As a matter of fact, Paul goes on in, in his evangelistic efforts to say that everyone is even more culpable, even more blamable for not believing because of the goodness that God actually shows us in the creation and that in spite of our sins. Paul and Barnabas, when they were preaching the gospel to the people of Lystra, who in this case I believe were the Greeks that were um, worshiping some false god. Uh, they brought out things to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas because they thought they were the gods come down from heaven. But this is what they say in Acts 14, verses 16 through 17. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So we, we see that God exists through the creation. We know that we're guilty uh, through our conscience. And we know that, um, again, that God is good, and he's good to us in spite of our sins through, through what he, he gives to us through the creation. Now, why does God show us all of these things? What, what is the purpose of, of this general revelation? Well, he shows us these things and gives us these things to wake us up, to get us to seek after this one who created, this one whose law we've broken, this one who is still kind to us in spite of these things. Paul said to the philosophers on Mars Hill in Athens in Acts 17, verses 26 through 28, and he, that is God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children." God intends what he reveals in the creation to wake us up and to get us to seek him. But he never intended these things to show us how to be reconciled to him and finally to enter into heaven. As a matter of fact, if we understand what the Bible actually says as we come into the world, we really don't want to know about these things until we're first concerned about them, unless we're first awakened by the Spirit of God through all these different means that the Lord has placed in the world to do this, as the Lord did to Luther. You know, he woke him up through the law. He woke him up through basically general revelation when that lightning bolt hit the ground. He reminded him of his frailty and of God's power and of his justice. And he was afraid, and that's why he immediately joined the Augustinian monastery in order to find salvation. But even there, he didn't find the way to be right with God. Not all of his penance, his confession and penance, and not all of his self-flagellation, his self-whipping, all of the things he denied himself, all the sacrifices he made, everything he did could not lead him to reconciliation with God. The only place we can actually learn to do that, how to be right with God, is through the second and main source of truth that God has given to us, and that is the Bible. Now listen to what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 16. He says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings of 
which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God. Now, notice that it was from the Scriptures that Timothy learned the way of salvation. And again, it's talking primarily about the Old Testament Scriptures. And why is that? Because Scripture is God-breathed. It is the breath of God. It is His very Word. God speaks in it, and He speaks through it. It's here alone that He shows us how we can be reconciled to Him through faith in His Son, Jesus. We didn't have the Bible we wouldn't have any understanding of how that is. This, oddly enough, was the one thing that was actually missing in Luther's life, was the scriptures. Not, not entirely, but again, I mentioned earlier that Luther studied the Vulgate. But God's salvation was actually hidden by that Latin translation. As a matter of fact, that's going to be you know, emphasized a little bit later in this series. Uh, the particular word that Jerome chose to, um, uh, to translate the word justification or to be made just, he used a Latin word that meant something different than the Greek word, and it obscured the idea of how one is actually made righteous in the sight of God, not through our works. We don't become personally righteous for God then to accept us, which is what the view of the church was in those days and continues today in, in the Roman church but that God imputes the righteousness of Jesus to us as a free gift and he counts us as righteous in Jesus and then begins to work in us to make us like Jesus. But at the moment that he credits Jesus' perfect obedience to us, we become just. And God then declares us to be just and from that point on, we can enter directly into heaven as soon as we die because we have a perfect righteousness. It's not our righteousness, it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So again, the Vulgate obscured this. Luther did not find it in the Vulgate. It was further hidden again by the religious system of the day that had led people to believe that if they were to seek salvation, they had to look to the church and they had to look to the priests rather than looking to Jesus alone. Remember, Faith in Jesus, that's essentially what Paul had told Timothy in that quote that I just quote, that the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And as you know very well, and we'll certainly look at this more two weeks from now, that grace and works are mutually exclusive. God says that salvation comes by faith, so that it may be by grace alone and not through our works. There will be works that follow, a life transformed by trusting in Jesus, but we don't work in order to get into heaven. Now, it wasn't until Luther began to study the Bible in the original languages that he saw the truth that we are justified. Again, not by earthly priests, not by grace coming through them, but through faith in Jesus alone, the faith that comes, or the grace that comes by trusting him alone to get us into heaven. When Luther saw that, it opened up heaven to him. His sins were forgiven. He actually uh, has have wrote down what his experience was in, in his works as he was speaking about Romans 1.17. He writes this, There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered the gates of paradise itself through open gates. There a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. Now again, up to this point, Luther believed the righteousness of God was the righteousness by which God himself was righteous, which condemned Luther. But Luther began to understand the righteousness of God is the righteousness which he gives through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness which belongs to Jesus to us as a free gift, making us righteous and acceptable in the Lord Jesus. And when he understood that, that was when the Lord quickened him to life. Actually, he quickened him to life in order to see this. But he was born again. If Luther understood this properly, he would have known the Spirit of God opened his eyes to see that. Sometimes it's so simultaneous, you can't tell which of it 
actually comes first. So again, the, the point is this, when it comes to salvation, truth, truth is the issue. It's not a matter of sincerity. Sometimes we place a lot of weight on, on sincerity. It doesn't really matter how sincerely one holds to their beliefs if those beliefs aren't actually true. We have to believe the truth. There's a lot of different religious systems out there. You know, there's the system of Rome. There's the system of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the system of the Mormons, the system of the Muslims. And we don't doubt that, that most of the people in these systems perhaps hold those beliefs sincerely. But sincerity is not the issue. The issue is truth. What did God actually say about how we are saved? We can't even be saved by our own personal beliefs unless they happen to be the same as what God says in His Word. If we don't know and act on God's truth, we cannot be reconciled to God. There are not many ways to God. There is only one way to God, and that's the way that's revealed in the Scripture. And God's Word is the only place we're going to find that particular truth. Now, that's why Jesus said this in His prayer to the Father in our text in John 17, verse 14. I have given them your words because that's the only way they could be saved. It alone shows us the only way of salvation. So we need the truth in order to be saved. We cannot be saved by error. It's, it's not going to work. Sincerity doesn't matter. What matters is truth. Now, secondly, we need God's truth to be sanctified. Okay, we can't become what He has saved us to become which are, of course, our lights in this world, apart from His truth. And further, unless we're, we're changed by that truth, at least in some visible way, we can't really know that we have been saved. You see, Jesus doesn't save someone and leave them the way that He found them. He works in them. Remember He told the scribes and the Pharisees, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. You're beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of corruption, like a, like a whitewashed tomb. But he said, clean out the inside first. Clean out the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become beautiful. That's what Jesus does. He cleans out the inside so that the outside or the way we live actually changes. And that's how we can know that we have been saved. It is the results of God's grace and His salvation. It's not the cause of it. Now, the Lord has a great deal to say about how we can know that we are saved in His Word. And it's certainly worth knowing what those things are to show us that we are saved, and I would recommend reading 1 John, that, that's a, written for that specific purpose. But let's consider the one thing Jesus points to in our passage in verse 14, the result of His having given them the Word. He says, I have given them your Word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And what Jesus means by that is, is this, that when we receive the gospel and we become part of God's kingdom through faith in the Lord Jesus, it immediately puts us at odds with the world because we have now become what Jesus is, and that is light, light in the way we live, light in the message that we share. That's something we we're actually focusing on in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in Matthew 5.14, you are the light of the world. And he tells us in John 3, verses 19 through 20, the world hates that kind of light, the light that Jesus actually was and the light he has made us to be. We read in, in John 3, 19 and 20, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and that means Jesus. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. One of the ways that we can actually know that we belong to Jesus is when the world sees that light emanating from us and they hate us in the way they hated Jesus. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Remember what Jesus said in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, 
For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You receive the word of God, you're going to be hated by the world. Now, we're going to see that when Luther becomes a champion of the gospel, that he is going to be hated. Now, he's going to be loved and he's going to be hated. He's going to be loved by those who belong to Jesus, but he's going to be hated by those who do not belong to Jesus. Sadly, there were a lot of them. Now, Luther saw this as one of the inevitable consequences of shining the light of God's gospel. He also wrote this, the gospel cannot be defended without tumults and without scandal. The word of God is a sword, a war, a ruin, a stumbling block, a destruction, a poison. And as Amos says, it meets us like a bear in the road or a lioness in the forest. The gospel shakes up people um, and it causes a response. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes we're reluctant to share it because it, it, it does cause this tumult. But you see, that's something we need to expect. That's something Jesus warned us about ahead of time. And not only that, because Jesus, of course, knew from his own experience, but you know, because as he shared the truth, he was, he was hated, wasn't he? Hated not just by the world, well, in a sense by the world, but by people who are actually his own people. He came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But he knew that his disciples, as they became these lights, they were going to be hated by the people of the world as well, which is why Jesus prays that the Father would protect them, and not just them, but everyone who would believe, us as well. Uh, Jesus continues in John 17, verses 15 through 16. <clears throat> I do not ask you to take them out of the world because of this hatred, but to keep them from the evil, the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Now again, it isn't entirely clear what Jesus means here by the evil one. Uh, I don't know if, if these um, uh, projections include the italicized words, but if, if you look in your translation of Scripture, you'll see that evil... Um, evil one, the word one there is in italics, which means it's supplied by the translators, which means that evil could refer to the evil one, uh, which is the devil, or it could refer to the evil that is in this world, and that would be the evil the devil actually creates, but through the people of the world who are basically under his control, uh, so it could be referring to that, and really either way amounts to the same thing. Because the devil usually does not attack us directly, but he attacks us more indirectly through the people of the world because the people of the world share exactly the same nature that the devil has and they share the same hatred for God's truth that the devil has. That's what the Bible actually tells us about them. So you shine the light, you're going to be hated by those who are in the world. And if you are hated by the world as we had seen on earlier occasions that tells us that we actually have become sons and daughters of light because that nature of Jesus is shining from us and the truth of Jesus is coming from us and the world is reacting to it as Jesus tells us. They will react to it. But we do need to bear in mind that Jesus not only wants us to shine that light, he wants us to shine it brightly. He wants our lives to reflect his life as clearly and as powerfully as we possibly can. And so, how does that actually happen? Well, that's what he says, why he says. He's given us his word. And why he's given us his Holy Spirit through the work that he did is so that we would become like him. It's only the word of God that the Spirit of God uses to make us like Jesus because it alone is the truth. Now again, listen to what Jesus says in verses 17 through 19 of John chapter 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself myself 
so that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. And what Jesus means there, of course, is that he has set himself apart to do the Father's will, to go through what the Father has for him, to drink the cup that he's about to drink, to lay down his life on Calvary. I've sanctified myself to carry out your will so that they may be sanctified as well, so that I may give them the Spirit, so that he can take that word and transform them into my image. That's what Jesus is talking about here, but it's the truth, you see, that makes us to be like Jesus, what the Spirit of God uses. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, last week, we looked at the three uses of the law. The law convicts us and points us to Jesus to be saved. Luther understood what God required. He knew he fell short. He was terrified. It convicts us and drives us to Christ. But having come to Jesus, Jesus points us back to the law in order to be sanctified. He points us to the truth. And of course, the third use is the law restrains sin, both in unbelievers as well as in believers because it shows us what our sins actually deserve. Now here, Jesus is speaking mainly of the second use of the law. He has given us his law. He's given us many examples of the law, many applications of the law. He's given us his own example of how to live according to that law so that we would know how to live, so that we could become like Him. He has given us His truth. Now again, the point here is that His truth, the Word of God, must have the last word on anything that has to do with God. Actually, it should be the first word, right? Have the first and the last word. It should have the only word on what we are to believe regarding God, who He is, what he's done, what he will do, why he's done it, particularly the way of salvation. And it must be the first and last word about how we are to live. Now again, going back to that text that, that Paul wrote to Timothy as far as knowing the scriptures that are able to make him wise unto salvation from his youth on, he says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You see, he's, he's saying exactly the same thing here that, that Jesus was praying in his prayer. I've given them your word. The world has hated them. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. This is what sanctification is to be taught, to be reproved, to be corrected, to be trained in righteousness, to be adequate, equipped for every good work, to be ready, to be like Jesus. And again, where do we find the standard? Where do we find our marching orders? Where do we find out what it is Jesus is like and what we are to do? We find it in the words, in the scripture. The Bible is the standard. Now again, we don't determine truth or we shouldn't by counting heads. Sometimes people do that. How many people believe this or that position? Well, more people believe this position, so that's the, the one I'm going to go with. Now, you can't determine truth by counting heads or by taking votes. You have to go to the Scriptures. Just because a person can argue a point very persuasively, you've heard debates, right, where you're, they're debating two different positions, sometimes the guy who wins the debate is actually wrong. But he won the debate because he was more persuasive. We cannot let somebody who's persuasive, or even a whole system of belief that is persuasive or, or huge or monumental, just because it's big and because a lot of people believe it or because there's somebody promoting it that's very persuasive, we cannot believe it just because of that. It has to agree with God's word. And certainly we don't want to base our belief system on, on merely general revelation because general revelation can be misunderstood. We can only know truth by reading and studying God's Word. If we frame our lives on anything else, Jesus said, we're building on a foundation of sand. The one who hears my words and acts upon them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And then when the storm came and the flood came and so forth, it was not, it was able to withstand it. It did not go down. You see, if we use any other standard, we're going to go off course. We need to allow the Spirit of God to govern our lives and to lead us through 
the scriptures. We need it to know the way of salvation, to be saved. And we need it to know how to live, how to become like him. Now, this evening, as I already mentioned, we're going to see how God used his word to lead Luther to Jesus and to salvation. And we're also going to see in the second lecture how neglecting the word led to further corruption in the church of that day. And remember, the church, the Western church, was one church at that time. How the building of St. Peter's, the desire to build this great edifice, actually led to a corruption that was the breaking point for Luther. And that's when he nailed his 95 Theses against the church door. Now, we're not going to see the nailing of the 95 Theses this evening, but we are going to see Luther's conversion, and we're going to see what, what is, exactly happened that brought about Luther's move to do what he did those 500 years ago. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to, um, well, to work in our hearts and to help us to refocus our lives based on, on his truth. Well, let's pray silently.